Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to those of you who are on Zoom. Uh, we're here at the University of Chicago campus. I am Scott Gelbach. I'm a political scientist here at the university in the Department of Political Science in the Harris School of Public Policy. This is our panel on Ukraine endures. This is the 365th day of the full-scale and unprovoked war in Ukraine. It's a time for us to take stock, to see where we are, to speculate on where we might be going. So we have an outstanding panel with us today to discuss these issues. Uh, I'm going to save uh, our guest of honor for last. Let me first introduce uh, uh, the other panelists. Um, so I have to my right, Susanna Bankla, who is a political scientist at Notre Dame University. To her right is Konstantin Sonin, who is an economist uh, here at Chicago in the Harris School. And to my far left, I have Monica Nalepa, who is a political scientist uh, also here in Chicago. To my immediate left, I have Timothy Milvana. Timothy is the president of the Kiev School of Economics. He's a former minister of economy in Ukraine. Uh, he is an economist, an economic theorist at the University of Pittsburgh. I could go on and on and on, but let me just say that Timothy and the people at the Kiev School of Economics are a very important part of the story of what has happened in Ukraine during the war. That when the history of the war is written, there's going to be a chapter on the role of civil society during the war. And there's going to be a part of that chapter that focuses on the activities of the Kiev School of Economics. Not to suggest that these activities and that the people there, that Timofey are so, are, are, are unique, but that they're, uh, they exemplify the sort of, of response by civil society in Ukraine to the war uh, through entrepreneurial activity and willingness to just step up and do what has to be done to be sure that, that Ukraine continues to move forward on various dimensions, even as Ukraine fights this war with Russia. Okay, so I'm gonna, we're gonna do, uh, do this as follows. So I'm gonna ask a few questions of Timofey at first, I'll then turn to our other panelists. I'll circle back around to Timofey at the end, and then we're gonna open it up to questions from our audience here. So we're gonna move pretty briskly, I think, to our, our initial questions to give time for our audience to pitch in here. We'll be out of here probably by 7.30 or so. That's the plan. Okay, so Timothy, one year from the start of the war in Ukraine. Tell us, you were here a week before Russia's invasion on February 17th of last year, when it looked like there might be war. The war seemed probable, maybe not yet inevitable at that point. Tell us about those last days before the war, where you were, and then the first days after the war started and what you saw. I didn't believe there would be a war. I thought the Russian government would be crazy to assume that Ukraine would give up. And I thought if that were to happen, it would be brutal, long. And I thought that Ukraine had at least 200,000 people who are combat trained since 2014. And they would all and more defend the country. And Russia at that point only had about 200K uh, deployed around the borders. But I was wrong on the conclusion that they would think that that they would understand that. There were other voices, especially in the US, uh, and we also had on the panel this discussion, uh, who were saying that Ukraine will fall. They were convinced that Russia would invade and therefore Ukraine would fall and would be horrendous. And I think they were correct too, in the sense that uh, it would be horrendous and Russia would invade, but they were also wrong about Ukraine would fall. So both sides were wrong. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, I didn't believe it uh, after I, I went to San Francisco right after this meeting for a conference 
But then on Saturday morning, I woke up to the news that Lufthansa is canceling and other airlines canceling and there are all the flights from Monday and the last flights from uh, Munich or Frankfurt were on Sunday. I just couldn't bring myself to think that my family and my loved ones and uh, people in in the school would be there stuck and I would be here. I just, just that's the driver. It's not something else. It's not some rational calculus. It's just simply I couldn't think about how is it that my sister, my wife, my nephew will be stuck in Ukraine if God forbid something happens. So I, I went back and uh, uh, the next several days were just normal. We were teaching, we were planning, we were meeting, we had security protocols in place. We had uh, contingencies. We actually have written down the contingencies such as Kiev is attacked with missiles, but we didn't believe it would happen. We assigned zero, problem. but we had contingencies what we do after that. And then this contingency happened, unfortunately. We, uh, the interesting thing during the first moments of the war um, is that you're so disoriented and you don't know it's a war. I thought it's my drunk uh, neighbor came back from a club and was moving furniture. And this was the, uh, that's why not explosions of missiles, uh, but other, but rather that it's just like a neighbor being an idiot. But then of course, in a little bit, uh, it became clear. And so we traveled. Um, I wanted to get out from my apartment and from any address where I can be um, potentially identified. And we had a backup plan. Backup plan was very bad because it was to go to sister's apartment and house, which was close to Hostomelia airport. By the time we got there, Russians were landing everywhere. So we had to drive further. Uh, but, you know, like that day I pushed, I asked to push payroll to the school forward so people get cash. Uh, I asked uh, everyone to make a decision whether they're going to go to the military or they're going to, uh, if they're not, then their job would be to get to safety and make themselves available to work. Because my view and everyone's view is that, you know, it's not the time to worry about things. It's the time to do what you have been trained to do. Whether you want to join the military, then that's your choice. But otherwise, you know, get your laptop, find a place to get to safety your family, stop worrying about it, and we'll give you a task to do, you know, a call to run on, on for, Stata, for the government. And then by Saturday, uh, we already identified that about 80% of our analysts and professors and faculty were available. So we were calling the government, the prime minister, and others saying that we are operational. Key School of, uh, of Economics is operational, give us tasks, they gave us tasks sanctions, monitoring, economy, um, and we started working and that's it. And then we have been working since that. That's it. Tell, yeah. tell us about some of those tasks. So what, what does mm -hmm. it mean to be an economist during a war? Are you providing economic analysis for the government? Uh, you've been doing a lot of fundraising, as I understand. What, what, what has the Kiev School done over the past? Yeah, so fundraising happened. It was not the plan. My plan was really focused on the analytics and policy for the government. Uh, fundraising happened uh, because other people uh, took leadership. Uh, the the, the 29-year-old uh, director of the foundation, uh, she was sitting under the bombs and she just had to do something So in Kiev. And so she started... Uh, she started uh, running, you know, fundraiser. She raised within a week five million dollars, basically to get bulletproof vests and uh, helmets for territorial defense because everyone was joining military and they didn't have any equipment. Um, uh, so that's what they did. And by now, it's a very large foundation, top three or top five in Ukraine. There's over forty million dollars in humanitarian support. We now do bomb shelters for schools. We repair clinics. Uh, we teach uh, leadership in war for businesses. So it's it's a good foundation. We try to fundraise mostly in the US, not in Ukraine, uh, because we want to bring foreign money into Ukraine and then do what we, we know well, education and humanitarian support. In the big country, what's, yeah. what's, what's the point of the bomb shelters? Well, the bomb shelters is, uh, you know, we had two years of a pandemic like everyone. Kids were not in school. Now we have the second academic year of war. And kids cannot be in school, in high school, in elementary school, unless they have a shelter. Because when a, an attack starts, they have to go into a shelter to be protected. And most schools, you know, 
including pretty much this one too, if there were attacks, you wouldn't have right now the facilities to accommodate all of us uh, in shelters, everyone who is. And you have to, if you run an educational process, let's say you run 15 classes in the building, you have to have 15 rooms on the ground. So uh, right now at the Kiev School of Economics, we can move the entire educational process within seven minutes. That's our internal task to on the ground. And so all the institutions have to have uh, on the ground facilities to continue to either teach or at least to, for them to wait. So in most schools, uh, we just find basements or something else which can be secured, retrofitted, you know, put a kind of protection uh, elements uh, fortified. Uh, so that the kids at least can go to, to school, be there, and when there is an attack, they can go on the ground and wait it out. And so we've been doing, you know, one, uh, it's it's pretty cheap, according, you know, in U.S. terms, it's 10 to 20 to $30,000 now per one basement that we are doing for one school. And it can bring up to, in residence tra uh, teaching, you know, 100 kids, 200 kids, 500 kids. Um, it's it's a good investment. We started doing it in September. No one was picking it up somehow. You know, it was a blind spot. So we, yeah. we're doing that. Uh, I think that's a good investment in education. Um, but um, on policy side, uh, we're doing sanctions, monitoring of the Russian economy, what works, what doesn't work. We're doing damage assessments. For the, and every number of the damage assessment you see in New York Times, Washington Post, or anywhere, that's done by us. We're secretary for your Mark McFall group, or we're doing some of the work for your Mark McFall group on sanctions. We do some food yeah, security. Mark McFall, who's the, the, the... It's a government, uh, international experts and Ukrainian government um, sang, uh, group, which designs uh, sanctions. For, it's a Ukrainian position on sanctions. Doesn't always correspond but uh, to what the EU does or what the US does, but that's what... Um, and then we do food security assessments, we do macro, we do, we do the standard things, but um, especially in the beginning of the war, the government didn't have capacity. Uh, like uh, in the Minister of Economy, out of 1,300 people may be available in the first days were 100, you know, 30. But the government has to continue to run. So, you know, institutions like ours uh, had to step in and provide uh, um, provide the back, the back office kind of analytics, they would focus on operations, but if we need to do something more of a, you know, calculation, something, we would do that. And I think that answers the questions, which I, I always hated it before the war, where people were asking, why do we need, you know, Ukrainian universities? Why do we need Ukrainian think tanks? Uh, we all have international, you know, where was the World Bank? I know the World Bank was evacuating from Ukraine, you know, uh, but we need to do calculations on the first days. And uh, th that's why you have in every country, you have to have agency in education and research. You have to have your own institutions because in the critical moments, they are also in some sense first responders just to different tasks. Uh, it morphed over time. We do more of a kind of uh, systemic, uh, more conceptual or strategic uh, policy making right now. I'm very proud we're doing this work. Uh, we're moving into humanitarian demining into priorities and analytics where um, with the business school, the business school is a separate story. The, the head of the business school, um, she was working so hard uh, she was online and, and there were like attacks and shellings in her village around. So she would not get out, you know, out of the building until it, uh, we, you know, like I would be on Zoom and, you know, her building would be shaking, you know. And then we real she realized that Russians have, Russian troops have overrun her village. You know, she was running the school but by, until, you know, basically there were Russian troops around. And so she managed to find some volunteers, like Uber driver volunteers who snatched her out. Uh, overnight and uh, she survived and this is you know this is I'm, I'm very relieved that uh, we didn't lose any any faculty or students in the first days of the war we have lost since that a lot of alumni and some students who went you know to and in some programs it's a large numbers and i'm not gonna go in details because i'll get upset about this uh but uh, you know a lot of students a lot of alumni went to the military and now they are the commanders or leaders that just serve um, so, you know, it's, it's, we're just doing what we can, I think. And everyone, and <clears throat> everyone in Ukraine is doing what they can. So, with, so, 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 so tell us something about that. So you're, you're, you're interacting with a, a lot of different types of people through the work that you do with, with school administrators, with people in yeah. government. Uh, you, you have, as I understand it, at time served as a sort of informal advisor to President Zelensky. So what is, what is the mood? I, I'm not really serving as an advisor to president. I, I exchange a couple of messages during yeah. the course of war. Yeah. I, I talk to a lot of other people in the government. 
But what I try to do is to help KC, the Kiev School of Economics running, that specific groups of people can provide specific advice to the point, you know, evidence-based, well thought out, well worked out to people who need it. You know, I'm not trying to be, you know, an advisor. I'm trying to be a manager who facilitates quality advice for the teams. Uh, but uh, what the mood? The mood is, you know, we're busy surviving. You know, it's just, uh, it's very, very positive and empowering. Um, there is a very clear meaning and objective which focuses everyone to get things done. Um, I think while the Russia and troops are destroying our country, uh, we also, the, we're building the country. It's a nation, nation forging moment. Uh, so that's the mood. I think uh, we are very optimistic. It's just the price that we're paying. You know, we realized it in 2014 that uh, democracy is not free when uh, our own police was shooting our own people. We have gone a long way since that. And now our military uh, can resist the Russian military and successfully, but the price has become higher. And so uh, you guys have democracy here. We also want to have democracy. For us, it is not free. Um, it is unfortunate um, that our, you know, we have to have our independence war. It just, uh, we will win. We will be a democracy in some form or another. Uh, we will, you know, Ukraine has surprised the world so many times now, you know, over the last year. Um, but it just, it's just so unfair that the price is so high. If I, if I could ask you a personal question, you. You must have a lot of friends who are Russian. You, you're fighting a war with Russia now. How do you think about the future and whether it will ever be possible to? I, I, I'm going to say things that maybe many Russian people will not like, even those who are anti-Putin. And but please understand me that I'm I'm in perspective where I feel that a different state, which is populated by people or have been citizens of this state. You know, it's bombing my people. And I don't think that uh, Russians are guilty, but I think Russians are responsible for not doing more to stop that. And I remember that I, I it's like I'm responsible for, for corruption in Ukraine, for not doing more, and for having weaker institutions when the war started. That's my responsibility, it's on me. I could have done more. And so Russians could have done more. I believe they could. You're an economic, so, theorist. Yeah. You're an economic theorist, you understand what the action problems is that. Yeah, true, but that's not how I think now. I think the, this kind of free riding problem, collective action, teams problem, Ukraine has been able somehow to solve it. I don't know how. Mm -hmm. So it's not a relevant model for Ukraine right now. And that's why Ukraine is so, it's actually, you know, if I, if I play an academic theorist for a second, the success of Ukraine or resilience of Ukraine shows how big this uh, uh, free rider team's problem is. Because the moment this problem is resolved, the moment people are focused on one objective and put uh, aside their organizational politics of frictions, um, fantastic things can be done. You know, today I'm on some emails with the Kiev School of Economics. Some faculties uh, has grievances about some other faculty about not being cited properly. I have very little tolerance for this. And I understand that technically he is correct, but I'm like, man, we're in war. And he says, stop painting it. I want to go to the, the ethics committee. I'm like, and I've spent half a day doing this, you know, checking this email. It's like took me out of all the mails, half a day, this bullshit about ethics committee and someone not citing somewhere. I mean, there's a damn war going on. And I think this uh, team's problem, free riding problem or ego problem is a big problem for humans. And Ukraine has uh, temporarily or not temporarily has resolved part of it. And that's why we're performing so much better. Why, uh, I guess, you know, it's clear because uh, we, we are facing a, an existential threat. Right, maybe one more question before I turn it to our other panelists. Is it Looking ahead, do you think it's going to be possible to sustain that coordination and pursuit of the common purpose after the war is over? For a while, yes, I think for a long while, because Russia is not going anywhere and the threat for Ukraine is not going anywhere. I think the threat is also for other countries too, uh, but I don't think that everyone understands. I mean, people kind of say this word that they understand, but people don't understand because Russia has built a machine 
of industrial scale of killing civilians. It's an industrial, that's the problem. It's not the problem. If humans have this disease, you know, we have seen it over the history of humans, that the, the states could go wrong, you know, they could, but when they go industrial, that becomes scary. And right now, there are tens of thousands uh, of officers in the Russian military who have no problem, in fact, enjoy, I think, many of them killing other people. And that's dangerous for all of us because we should, it's, exist, it's, it's, it's a threat, it's a disease, it's like cancer, it's a disease for humankind. If it grows, if it's left unchecked, bad things happen. Uh, and I think people are thinking geopolitics, geography, land, this and that, leaders, you know. But I think there, there's a much bigger problem. The bigger problem is somehow, again, we have industrial scale of uh, civil and murder. And I think that that is a problem. Let's, let's let's talk about geopolitics mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, Monica Nalepa, so a, a, one of the surprises, there are many surprises, but one of the surprises over the past year is how united has been, how united the West has been in, in support of Ukraine. So to you, does that support seem at, at all fragile? And, and maybe to make this especially concrete, what, what do you see in your own country of Poland, which, which is quite critical? Thank you. Um, so at first, uh, it indeed did seem as if, you know, this was just what the liberal opposition needed in Poland, which is a country that has been gradually backsliding, unfortunately, back into authoritarianism, more or less starting in 2015. And part of that uh, backsliding has been built around uh, EU skepticism. So basically, yeah. Uh, doubts that, that that being part of the EU is is a, is of any use to Poland. And when the war started, I have to say that, that skepticism ceased to exist, and there was this sort of uh, rallying around the principle of international organizations are definitely giving more benefit to Poland than they are hurting them. Um, but I have to say that what has transpired since. Uh, is a little bit more complex. So um, so so Poland practically because of its backsliding, had been enthralled in this conflict with the European Court of Justice about surrounding uh, uh, judicial reforms that undermine rule of law. At the same time, once the war started, Poland had accepted a lot of almost 4 million refugees from, from the Ukraine, and uh, which of course carried with it a lot of expenses. And it expected from the EU to be compensated for that. Uh, at which point EU said, well, yes, we'll transfer the funds, but only if you um, fix these judicial <clears throat> reforms and actually strengthen the rule of law. And uh, it's election year now in Poland, and the current ruling government piece uh, decided to basically implement as minimum of changes to the previous judicial reforms as possible, and is still counting on getting uh, EU funding. And at this point, the EU basically cannot afford uh, to, um, to 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 break up uh, EU unity, so it seems that from so you know point, it, 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 that that the the, the 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 necessity of supporting Ukraine has allowed has allowed bad actors to ha, has allowed has allowed basically Poland to sort of like skirt uh, mm -hmm. how little it can do to to to, to support rule of law. So mm -hmm. I feel like uh, yes, it will be probably the peace government will be compensated for help to Ukrainian refugees. Probably it will win the, the next election. And as a result, the rule of law system is, is suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's extremely important that uh, right next to Ukraine, which is going to be building its democracy, there be a strong uh, democracy in the form of Poland, not one that is that is wavering. Is the Polish um, population, like what, what, what is public? So it's very interesting because in the first, so so first of all, when there's a war in Ukraine, that's extremely close to home, right? So there were there were uh, was at least one explosion that actually killed Polish citizens because, uh, because the, the border is so close. Today, before coming here, I saw that there are uh, military fortifications being raised in the, in the border with the Kalinskaya Oblast. So Poland also has a super small border, border with Russia. So it definitely strikes very close to home. Second, there have been uh, for years now, Ukrainians, Belarusians working in Poland uh, as guest workers. So uh, it's very common to hear Ukraine, to hear Ukrainian, to hear Belarusian just spoken on the streets of Poland. Uh, so uh, in the first months of, of the war, it was a very natural 
place to 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 come because what, what where are you going to seek refuge where you know people right where you know that you know you you have a home you have a roof over over your head uh, and in the initial months of the crisis of the war the Polish government was even subsidizing uh, Polish citizens who uh, accepted as guests refugees in their homes. Only three months later to pull those funds. So the moment that basically this uh, this enthusiasm for supporting Ukrainians started sort of uh, dampening, that's when the funds were also pulled. So this also created a little bit of discord. And you've mentioned problems of collective action. So of course, that's when uh, questions to the EU started being directed. Well, who's going to compensate Poland for this? So I would say that the, the, the point of all this is from uh, the unity of the West or the unity of Western Europe, at least, uh, being a byproduct of the crisis, it started to be used as an instrument for not so well-intentioned actors to accomplish their long-term goals. Thank you. Let, let, let me turn now to Susanna Vingla. So Susanna, you're, you're uh, an expert in food and agricultural policy in this part of the world. And Ukraine is, is one of the world's major grain suppliers. And there was a lot of concern, obviously, at the start of the war about how this is going to affect uh, deliveries of, of grain to, to other parts of the world and, and food security in other parts of the world. Tell us a little bit about what's happened in the past year and where we are now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I usually start with reminding everyone, uh, many of you will already notice that Ukraine is a very fertile country. It, it has uh, you know, incredible soil, it has long growing seasons, it has warm weather, right? So that is the reason why it actually has been uh, a, a breadbasket and has been feeding the rest of the world for, for a long time, right? With, with a, a gap in the 20th century. Um, Today, uh, Ukraine supplies about 80% of China's corn. That's a lot of corn, uh, about 15% uh, of global corn, 10% of global wheat, and 40% of global sunflower seeds, right? So there's a, that's a lot of industrial crops that come out of Ukraine. So the reason this matters uh, is because uh, with the Russian naval blockade, that Ukraine, that food, that's not just a commodity, it's actually food that's been stuck in Ukraine, right? So when we think about the war, we often think about the map and sort of the line, the front lines, right? There's in the New York Times, you have the, the red parts and the blue parts. Um, those maps often exclude the naval blockade, but it's really, really important because it actually gives Russia a lot of leverage uh, over the Ukrainian economy, because this is so important for the Ukrainian economy, but also for the rest, over the rest of the world, right? So this was particularly obvious uh, in the first few months of the war when, when grain was basically piling up in Ukraine, right? So the naval blockade meant that the ports were closed. A number of ports were actually occupied. Other parts of the ports were closed. And then no ships could come and go, right, through, through the Black Sea. So uh, as the great, uh, what, what happened in addition is that Russia would actually uh, destroy uh, port infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure, grain elevators, uh, and and other and you know bird fields and steel tractors and so on. So there's a lot of damage that was done to Russian agriculture and grain was sort of stuck in Ukraine. So what that meant in the first few months of the war is that Ukrainian farmers couldn't do anything with their grain. Their sort of grain was piling up, uh, and the world just sort of didn't get the Ukrainian grain that they were uh, counting on. So so that meant that prices of all agricultural commodities in Ukraine were were dropping. So farmers couldn't sell their commodities. They had a lot of costs. Fuel prices were really expensive, uh, but they couldn't sell the grain. And the world, uh, the world prices uh, for food commodities uh, rose even further, right? So uh, the world global commodity prices for food had already been high before the war started because of COVID, uh, and they just kept climbing. So that raised a, 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 a whole series of, of problems for many countries. We all sort of probably noticed food price inflation uh, but it was really a problem for uh, a number of uh, low and middle income countries that subsidize uh, grain, right? So I Egypt, think, uh, there was a, I'm sorry, go ahead, no. Each, my, my list, Egypt, Turkey, Bangladesh, Nigeria uh, are sort of the main, Indonesia. Those are really uh, countries with large populations that rely on, on grain, imported grain. And there was some sort of deal towards the end of last year. Yes, right? uh, it was actually, uh, it was a sort of, the, so so the, let me just tell you what happened in these, in these countries. So in, 
Turkey is particularly important, Egypt is really important. So these governments subsidize grain. Um, and what they could do is either continue subsidizing grain, which means it gets ever more expensive, um, or they could stop subsidizing grain, which meant you know people didn't uh, couldn't buy as much much food. So what what happened in July of 22 is that um, the UN and Turkey brokered a deal between Ukraine and Russia. This is actually the only thing that Russia and Ukraine have agreed on is a partial easement of the naval blockade for food exports. Right, so it's called a uh, Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative. Uh, it's also known as a grain corridor. So some food could sort of uh, leave the Black Sea under this uh, auspices of these uh, agreements. So the problem with that agreement was it was only valid for 120 days uh, and it had to be renegotiated. Um, and so it was politically tenuous, it was limited uh, and, and Russia kept threatening to pull out. It actually threatened to pull out. So the first uh, 120 days were over at just before Halloween end of actually early November. And on October 29, Russia threatened to pull out um, of the renewal. And so uh, grain futures immediately went up again. Um, and uh, Russia sort of received a, a bunch of concessions uh, to be sort of course at coaxed back into the agreement. So eventually the agreement was um, uh, renewed for another 120 days, mostly because of uh, Erdogan's uh, intervention. So Turkey has played an incredibly important role for a number uh, of reasons. So the second uh, agreement is now coming due again in March. Um, uh, Turkey, as you know, um, had an earthquake and Erdogan is up for re-election. So he's probably uh, worried about grain prices again, but uh, I, it, the world really needs more than 120 days. This 120 days is, is really tenuous and Ukraine needs more than 120 days, right? Because farmers need to plan. It's really hard to uh, farm if you don't know if you can sell your grain. Uh, Very good, thank you. But let's, let's talk directly about Russia. So Konstantin Sonin, this war could end tomorrow if Russia decided to end it and to withdraw from Ukraine. My sense is that's unlikely as long as Putin remains in power, or at least as long as there's no great political pressure on Putin to end the war. Tell us a little bit about where you see maybe both elite and popular opinion in Russia today. Uh, okay, I, I, I think you're right. I think that Russia could end this war at any moment just by announcing a unilateral ceasefire and starting to withdraw troops and the war would be, uh, would be over. I also think, I mean, this is a decision to continue the war, to escalate. This is basically a decision that Putin, the Russian government, they are do, doing it every day that to continue uh, to continue with the war. I also do not think that it's likely that they will uh, stop this war because the way the government operates in Russia is basically Putin decides everything. And although the Russian government is sort of highly institutionalized, there are a lot of committees, there are a lot of people in different positions. There is a cabinet, minister's cabinet that has constitutionally more powers than many cabinets around the world. There is a parliament that has a lot of power. They, this is all on paper, and they do not participate in the in the decision making. So this is like a bad thing because I think Putin and his entourage they are basically absolutely insulated from any kind of incoming confirmation. They were insulated before the war, so they started this war based on very like. Um, unrealistic assumptions both about the Russian army, about the Ukrainian army, about the state, Ukrainian state, about the Ukrainian nation, about the uh, Western response. And I think they still live in this fantasy, like sinister fantasy world. And when we watch President Putin, I think that he's sincere in the sense that this crazy world that he's talking about, the world in which not he, that send tanks to Ukraine and bomb Ukrainian cities, but someone else started this war. This is like the world in, uh, that he actually lives in. So that's a kind of that's a kind of a problem. But I think that this cannot uh, survive for a long time. Unfortunately, in these two or three years, until I think 
the Putin's government uh, collapses, there will be a lot of lives lost, a lot of innocent lives lost, a lot of um, lives for responsible uh, lost. But I think that um, this collapse will happen. In the same way, like 100 years ago, in 1914, there was a huge wave of enthusiasm in Russia when Russia entered World War I. People were just literally volunteering for uh, military service. And in two years, basically, the whole state disintegrated. Nobody, uh, nobody had any trust in the um, in the emperor, in the cabinet, in the parliament, in any kind of institutions. And I think this is what is brewing there under the surface. Because on one hand, we we could say that we've seen only um, only twenty thousand Russians were arrested. Uh, arrested for anti-war, anti-government protests during the war in a country of 140 million people. This is a small amount. At the same time, we do not see uh, any kind of uh, grassroots enthusiasm for this war. So during the summer, the government was offering, uh, basically, um, they offered, they called for volunteers, offering payments 10 times the average salary in regions, and nobody would volunteer. So they had to go with the, um, basically with the conscription. Yeah. When, like when we see, when we see like, I don't know, Putin's, um, Putin's gathering, then they would have the same 20 stars who are also lavishly paid for participating in this. So like there, there is are, no- There were 100,000 people in Nishiki Stadium a couple of days ago. So yeah, but really... there, were, there was also 10,000 buses that brought these people brought these people there. And if you look at the people who, at the artists, at the music stars who were actually there, these are the same 20 music stars who are all not popular among, uh, among young people. And it does, it does seem that most of the music stars, most of the popular people, even if they're not openly sort of anti-Putin, they're basically trying not to participate in anything like this. So I think that the Russians are not strong enough to fight Putin, but they're also totally not enthusiastic. And I think the time is certainly not on Putin's side. One more question about, I guess, the lead opinion. So, so you know some of the people who we call uh, Russian oligarchs. So these are not, these are people who survived gang wars in the 90s. They're people who have been exposed to violence in the past. I think the hope was, why the passivity? I, I guess the hope at the beginning of the war on the part of some policymakers was you seize yachts from Russian oligarchs in the Mediterranean and they're going to respond by putting pressure on Putin to end the war. Was that, uh, I was think, that yeah. Right. I think this is a fair question. I think they are basically as stunned as uh, ordinary people. So when you see ordinary people being uh, mobilized like in the province and going basically to slaughter because they receive very little training and then everybody is surprising why they're so passive. The same with the uh, Russian oligarchs. A lot of them lost a lot of money because of this war. They lost their, out, out, uh, their, their possessions abroad. They lost a lot of a lot of business the way they lived and still they're sort of absolutely passive. So it appears that the only difference between them and those people who get mobilized and then slaughtered uh, is that they have more money and because of this money they do not go to the army service but otherwise they're basically in the same shipish like, position. Okay, maybe one more question for Team with me before we open it up. So, so this war has lasted a year already. Where do things go from here? And and what do you want the people in this room and on this Zoom call to know that maybe they don't know already about the war in Ukraine? I don't know how long the war will last. I know that uh, from the game theory of conflict theory, we know that we better be ready to go for a long time that increases our chances to stop earlier. Mm -hmm. Because 
it creates incentives so it makes it clear that the war cannot be won by Russia. So empowering Ukraine is critical. There are essentially two positions now, you know, kind of appeasement escalation and escalation or you know strengthening. And I think you have to strengthen to the escalate because unfortunately, unfortunately, Putin doesn't live in the world in which negotiations or you know willingness to compromise is perceived as a sign of strength. It is perceived as a sign of weakness which can be exploited. In fact, it just welcomes. So future aggression. Had we imposed sanctions in 2008 after Georgia was involved, had we had a strong response towards that, we probably would not have had Crimea, or would not have had Aleppo, we would not have. There's nothing new in the playbook. The scale is bigger. The scale is just getting bigger, the grueso. So in that sense, I think it is important to stop the war, but it will be done by strength. Unfortunately, for everyone. Okay. Let's open it up. This is maybe an appropriate time to say that this event is, is co sponsored uh, by the uh, Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies uh, here at the university, uh, organization whose name we're going to have to change at some point, I think, um, by the uh, Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, uh, and by the Becker Friedman uh, Institute. So thanks to all of those organizations for sponsoring uh, this uh, event today. So let's open it up to you all. What, what questions do you have for our panelists? Over here. Um, you had mentioned um, do you think Ukraine will be able to deal with corruption on the door? Okay, so the, I'm going to repeat the questions just because I think the microphones up here are not going to be able to pick up the questions from the audience. There's a question about uh, corruption in Ukraine and, and uh, the probability that Ukraine will be able to successfully deal with corruption after the war is over. Okay, so let me just separate immediately the perception of corruption about Ukraine and the actual level of corruption. And to give you evidence that th things have changed in 2014, Ukrainian military didn't put up any resistance in Crimea. Crimea has fallen without a shot, partly because military was corrupt. And, uh, you know, military just switched sides. Some others uh, went to Ukraine, but didn't fight. Today, we have a very different military, and that alone shows the progress and difference. Of course, Ukraine was corrupt, and the height of corruption was at the time of the proxy, Russian proxy president Yanukovych. And it was beyond corruption. At that point, if they liked the business, they would take your business. They would take half of your business. And if you disagree, you would disappear or you would be arrested. That'd be, that was mafia state. And that's what the revolution of dignity in 2014 partly was against. And then we had all these stories about this exotic zoo and golden bread by the president of this lavishness and yeah, so much is yeah, in, in, in his, his residence in his residency and this unbelievable luxury and people were outraged so in 2014 people were outraged at corruption in ukraine because it was unjust but today people are outraged at corruption for very instrumental reasons because a thousand dollars stolen it means a thousand dollars less spent on ammunition which means people will die. And that's how the public feels today about corruption. So I am confident that feel will perceive because every family, every organization, every building has people who have died. And that is directly to our ability to resist and save lives is directly related to our ability to use those scarce resources that we have efficiently. I also think it's a culture problem because people who are engaged in corruption, especially during the war, but generally, these are the very same people who in Russia decide that the world is a cynical place and everything is for sale. So it's the same kind of thinking 
this respect to, for human life, there's the respect for democracy, the respect, disrespect for agency of people, disrespect for humans. These are people who believe that everything is for sale. Everything can be sold, everything can be bought. So in that sense, Ukraine is fighting two wars. One is on the front line and one is domestically. And those guys who are domestically during the war, imagine this, we have tens of thousands you know, killed. They, some people are trying to profit from the war. They are as bad as the invaders. And that's how we feel about it. But those people also don't understand. There is no reasoning with them. You know that also has to be solved by brute force. They will have to be prosecuted. They will have to be arrested. They will have to serve terms. So I think it's it has become very serious in Ukraine. Is it possible yeah. to translate that public opinion into institutions that will survive the war? It is working uh, in the sense that uh, we are a democracy, and the politicians respond. And what is different right now that the recent two scandals about corruption in Ukraine are relatively minor in terms of amounts if we compare it to, let's say, Yanukovych times, or, you know, five years ago or something. But also, what's new, they are preemptive. It's not that we're looking at the exotic zoo of Yanukovych and saying, oh my God, how much, you know, funds, you know, money has been stolen. We're looking at a contract which was signed in December. It's not even clear that that contract has an overall price above the market. There are discussions about that. The money has not changed hands. Payments have not been made. And there's already prosecution. So it's a, it's a very preemptive. And on both contracts where there were scandals, they are preemptive. No payments have changed. No damage has been done. There have been attempts, so there is some perception. So it's, it's very different. The institutional framework is there. It is already there. I think the institutional framework misses competence. So it will take time for judges or uh, uh, prosecutors to become competent because they sometimes are a little, you know, like on PR side, they want to get things done. So there's that. And then we really have a problem, a culture problem with judges. And uh, people uh, attack me for that saying, I think the culture problem with judges is not going to be resolved by better laws. We actually have better law schools. We have to create better law schools with better culture, with groups of people who provide support to those who, who believe in different values in courts. Because otherwise, those good judges, they're in minority and they're looked upon as, you know, as they're some kind of crazies, you know. So the, unfortunately, the judge, you know, there's this trade-off between independence. You know, the courts have to be independent. The courts are independent in Ukraine. But, you know, what do you do with independently corrupt courts? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, like, that's not an easy thing. I will give one, one example and then I'll shorten. So, for example, when I was a minister, when I was a minister, I fired a guy from an agency. That guy... I believe was corrupt. I couldn't prove it. So the guy sued me and opened criminal investigation against me. Okay, we worked it out somehow and it's not fully democratic means that the investigation was shut down. Okay, because he paid the guys to, you know, anyway. So, so I got out somehow and he went back to the office. You know, minister number three, he is back serving the agents. The court restored it. The war starts, this guy steals, you know, eight million dollars or five million dollars and tries to run away. Now he's on Europol and Interpol list. I was right seven years ago or five years ago or three years ago. I couldn't prove it, so what, you know? It's not an easy thing when it comes to the institutional detail about, you know, it's not good enough in a democratic country to have a hunch as I did that this guy is corrupt. But, you know, I can't prove it, but they are corrupt. They're good at that. Because the bad ones have not survived. You know, the deep state is very professional. So, you know, you have to balance it between basically doing some extrajudicial stuff and cleaning up the institution and yet not turning and not, not creating new monsters in the process. So that has been a challenge. Uh, and it's just not an easy issue. But Ukraine has done tremendous progress, as I just illustrated with the one institution military, but there are others. Uh, government procurement is procurement, government, banking system. Mm -hmm. Banking system, financial system was extremely corrupt. The oligarchs used it as basically, you know, for financing their own, you know, needs. And if something goes wrong, 
They would put it on the banks. Banks would go to the taxpayers' money, things like that. That was the easiest way to get, even easier than uh, procurement. Because you give out a loan and the loan is not returned until 20 years from now. It's not in procurement list, you steal something. You, you can check the prices in loans, or you know, 20 years from now, they will return, you know. So not a single bank fell during the beginning of the war. There was no bank runs. The trust in the system was so high that the currency did not devalue in the beginning of the war. Later, because of macroeconomic reasons, in the summer it did. But it's also by 15, 20 percent. In 2014, the currency devalued, you know, lost 30, 50, 70 percent of its value. It's a very different world. So there are structural reforms which have been successful. There are structural reforms which have not been. The reforms which still need work, competition authority, oligarchs, monopolies, financing of political systems, legalizing lobbying you know, or making it transparent, conflict of interest in those areas. You know, you can't just ban lobbying. You cannot just ban political financing. You know, you have to create rules, right? So that people know this is okay and this is okay. And this is not okay. Otherwise, how do you finance political campaigns? They will be financed. If you pretend that there is no money behind political campaigns, you shouldn't be surprised that the politicians will be corrupt. So there is a lot of work which needs to be done, but there is a lot of work which has been done. I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is the governments are not uniformly corrupt or honest or competent or incompetent, but there are parts of the government that work well, and there are parts of the government that work. I'll just add more that and shut up government. on this. So I, when I was the Minister of Economy, I was really, and you have to work inside. So I was really, you know, it was bewildering, I, I guess, really astounding that I would walk on, on a, in a corridor and the department on the left would be all super clean and ethical and the department on the right would be super black, dark and corrupt, you know, and they would just be there in the same ministry, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they would coexist. So, and you take one of them at a time, you know. So anyway. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> More questions. In the background. So yeah, obviously it was terrible. Um, and so John Gershman is a the fact that's coming in here at Chicago, and he makes the argument. How do you pronounce that? John Gershman. Uh, John Gershman. <laughs> <laughs> so, I saw him on TikTok. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just summarize his position in case nobody. Somebody here doesn't know what he said. He basically made the point that the West is at least partially responsible for the war and could have avoided it by maybe scaling back militarily and scaling back the expansion of NATO and the European Union. Um, I think it's it's uh, it's clear that there's a stark difference between the world of democracy and, and Putin's regime in Russia. My question, and it's a political question, more than a economic question, is looking over the past decade and escalating tensions, was a large scale conflict inevitable? Or was there a world where we had democracy and futures regimes and places like Okay, there's a few questions there. I, I should just say it's a shame that we don't have my colleague, Professor Mearsheimer, with us this evening. We've had several of these events, and and uh, he hasn't um, uh, been in the audience for any of them. But but who would like to yeah, who would like to take, take this this up? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. I, I think that this whole concept of someone or some country being forced is a sort of sort of overused. Right? Sometimes countries you could imagine that a country is like totally surrounded by foreign troops and there is an imminent invasion. But historically, even in such situations like in 99, in 1973 during the Yom Kippur War, although the Arab countries were actually um, gathering armies around Israel. Israel still did not attack. They waited until they were, were attacked, exactly for the reason that countries and actually individual people were responsible for what they do. And we could look at what, um, what was happening. There were no any kind of threat from Ukraine to Russia. You could imagine, and that's what I would have said. I mean, actually, I said it to John. Um, Professor Mearsheimer uh, back uh, a year ago that um, that you could conceivably imagine a threat to Russia from the United States, 
but Russia did not attack the United States. Russia attacked Ukraine, which was not any kind of a threat to Russia. But the thing is that it's sort of a mute point now, because now Russia announced that this is about a territorial conquest and annexed uh, four uh, large parts of Ukraine, including some parts that are not even occupied, right? So it's a kind of, we could have a theoretical argument with Professor Mirsheimer, what caused Russia, but you cannot be forced to uh, conquer something, right? So now this, I think this argument uh, was like ultimately resolved. So I have, a, a, first of all, I think um, I, I want to make three points. One is um, there is intellectual arrogance in believing that the U.S. has that much influence over the future of what happens there. The U.S. can contribute by helping with weapons or not, but they, they believe that something, someone in D.C. sitting in some offices decides the future of nations elsewhere has been proven wrong in many countries in which U.S. has intervened, Okay. So just let's, and also let's not make this mistake in the future. Once something changes in Russia, let's not try to build a democracy or prop some governments there. Let have Russians figure out how they want to live their lives. They need to do some thinking about it, okay? So that's the answer. So in that sense, I don't understand the relevance of that hypothetical or counterfactual, what could have been done if some, that's, that's very ego pleasing that we are doing something. But, you know, if I take that argument seriously, I would say, you know, how the war could have been avoided if Ukraine did not denuclearize. If Ukraine had nukes right now, there would be no war. Ukraine never had operational control over nuclear Well, weapons. you know, so what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they could have, they could we could have put, yeah. put it on something, yeah. Yeah. on a drone, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So, and, you know, there are some other arguments of the same line in the sense that, you know, and this really pisses me off because in this type of arguments, it's the same as a Russian argument where agency of Ukrainian people is robbed. You know, earlier today, I had the discussion in Northwestern where I asked, why do you think Ukraine survived the war or was so endurant? And the person said, well, because Russians did the attack strong enough, you know, <laughs> and it's still in the mindset of people, it's U.S. versus Russia. It's not, it's like, it has nothing to do with that. In 2014, the European foreign ministers came and brought her a peace between the protesters and Yanukovych, and it li uh, li uh, lived long enough for them to get to the airport, okay? That's the amount of, you know, there are fundamental forces there at play caused by the collapse of the Soviet Union, different cultures. One takes state above people agency and the other takes people agency above the state. And so Ukraine takes people above the state, whereas Russia takes the state above the people. And that's what the conflict is about. And one of the systems will prevail. I hope it will be Ukraine, but it's not guaranteed. Let's move on to other questions. Maybe we can follow up after the panel with a discussion of whether Adolf Hitler was forced to invade Poland because of laws in the Versailles Treaty. So the question over here. It's uh, John Rushkamer was brought into the conversation. Oh, do we have to do this again? <laughs> The mode is that Ukraine should not, uh, he was one of the few um, uh, US academics who wrote uh, that uh, Ukraine should not give up uh, nuclear weapons back in the 90s. However, um, uh, if you listen closely to his speeches, especially when he was much less guarded in his remarks in the video that has about 30 million views on YouTube, a intellectual uh, John Timer uh, from 2014, he calls a revolution of dignity a coup. He um, uh, calls participants of uh, the, in the revolution neo Nazis. Uh, he, he makes a lot of really unfounded, and he is not an error expert, actually. 
Yes, zero. It's not on this panel. Yes. Uh, but okay. That's okay. That's okay. my question here is, uh, it, it is different. It is absolutely no secret that uh, John Rothschild accepted uh, Russian government money. Uh, so my question is an ethical one. Uh, do you think it is ethical for an academic to accept money uh, while, for example, taking a position, uh, like a, a really critical position? Uh, and uh, should he be public, <clears throat> an academic be public about it? Okay, How's, thank you. The question is, is, is whether, whether there's uh, whether it's ethical to to speak on a topic uh, when you've taken money from a government that has an interest in the topic. So Constantine, I'm going to let you address this quickly uh, because, as I understand it, the allegation here is that Mearsheimer um, may have been Professor Mearsheimer may have been influenced by the fact that he uh, received money from the Baltic Club. You've also been involved. Yeah, with, I mean, that's all the club. I was not paid, maybe I missed uh, something. No, I, I think uh, not enough views. I, I think uh, at the uh, Valdai clubs, when they were important, there were a lot of people who were not uh, Putin lovers, and there were actually some Putin haters among the people because the idea of those to organize them was to have a kind of a good selection. So I would not count participation in forums as a kind of. Um, as a kind of a monetary transfer, it's still there are academics who are being paid. Like if you, um, if you heard the name of Robert Skidetsky, who's a famous biographer of John Maynard Keynes, he was sitting like on several boards of state Russian companies, and he is a major, um, major advocate for uh, for appeasement. This I think is a huge conflict of interest. I have not heard a kind of a credible evidence about Professor Mishramer and if the if he actually received money then he should have disclosed it to the <laughs> University of Chicago. As so, I understand the allegation this is more about intending to die events, but I'm not totally no, 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 totally I, good. Uh, I, okay, yeah. yeah I know we'll go okay, about we, we need to move on to other but just quickly, quickly, quickly. Quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the wrong way of, it's like uh, people take money. I you know I'm in Ukraine I take a lot of money at the Kiev School of Economics from the US, from Europe, from Ukraine. Uh, the key, when you think about this type of issues, the key is independence, not the fact that you're taking money. So I, would I take uh, money from Russia to kill Russians right now? Okay, all right. Uh, if you can give me Russian money to buy weapons in Ukraine, I'll do it. I have no problem with that. So I, I think that's not the right way of thinking about it. The right way of thinking about it is if you continue to be independent. But I, I still think it's secondary. I think the academics have the intellectual responsibility to figure out the truth and not to follow just a sexy, contrarian, critical thinking that I criticize everything which is out there. They criticize in mainstream, is a good theoretical exercise to keep yourself to keep yourself in check, but it should not be the sole objective, especially during the times when tens and hundreds of thousands of people are dying. So then people have a responsibility to either shut up or figure out the truth. All right? I think that's the real ethical issue. If you don't know what you are talking about, don't talk about it. Other questions? No, I saw That's you. a strong restriction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would shut up a lot of it there. I saw you earlier. Yeah. Well, I think I'm going to change my question now because it, it, we recalled um, the last time it was with Timothy and he said he was pissed and I was kind of. I'm always pissed. <laughs> you should understand why. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally yeah. Understand. <laughs> I totally understand why. I, I guess I had uh, th that question was. You were angry about the level of support that Ukraine was receiving. In support, so insufficient support. You felt, uh, and so I was going to ask um, yeah, whether you feel that the level of international support is um, it's adequate. Is adequate? Um, the question I, is whether whether the level of international support at, at this point is is adequate. And the answer is, is, is the same. With the, the answer is the same as before. It is not adequate. Am I angry about this? I've learned to accept it. I think it's also unethical. 
to you know the budgets uh, the governments around the world are increasing defense budgets by one or two percent of gdp everywhere and the war could be stopped with one hundreds of that but everyone is bumping up their industries instead of actually in good faith trying to trying to provide security to ukraine to actually stop the war in that sense it's unethical but in fairness, some of, some, some of that is, is trying to replenish stocks that have been drawn down. During that, the war. No, no. Yeah. So that is all true. But if you look at the numbers, mm -hmm. the, what has been spent on Ukraine is, you know, tens of billions of dollars or maybe hundreds of billions. But the amount which if you look at the budget expenditures mm -hmm. for the next 10 years, what the countries are allocating, countries are scared. Mm -hmm. They are investing in their own security. That's a collective action problem. It would be much better to focus on stopping the war by strengthening Ukraine to the extent that it would make no sense for Russia to even try to move any further. And that would be it, you know. Mm. Instead of that, it's like oh, instead of having collective security, everyone trying to build their own security. That's much more expensive. Okay, who else? Okay, over here. You can collect a couple of questions. Yeah, let's collect a couple, maybe. We're in Chicago, couldn't help but notice a massive influx of people coming from Ukraine lately, and they open their businesses, they put their kids in schools here, uh, buy housing, they can afford it. And that makes me think that probably in Europe we have something similar, probably on a big scale. Even. So my question is about on the views about the democracy. Obviously, if you want to have a healthy economy, we need an adequate population to run it. Um, and apparently, you know, a lot of people have moved on. And uh, if I was anxious, a lot of them were saying that um, they may not be coming back. So, like, what's the view of uh, of the governments of the Ukrainian agencies on this? Let's 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 hold on to that. But the yeah, question, sure. the question, just to repeat it, is: it, there are millions of Ukrainians living outside of Ukraine today as a consequence of the war, and and um, if those people don't return, then whatever else happens, Russia has won, won the war, if I could paraphrase a little bit. So anyway. how to think about that. Yeah. Okay, let's let's take another question. Yeah, over here. Um, uh, so the reporting we from here that China might be sending weapons to Russia, Russia is supporting China to send weapons. How likely do you think that would be, and how could that be deterred? Okay, question about China uh, and possible uh, uh, provision of uh, weapons uh, to Russia and, and the likelihood of that scenario. Let's maybe take one more. All men. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. Can you tell us more about what was done in Ukraine uh, to fight corruption to make the government more efficient and like to basically allow the government to run uh, during the war and to be like even more and more efficient? Okay. Question about how the Ukrainian government has evolved during the war. So, so I think. Part, uh, yeah. 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 So, so I think the two of you, those are all on your wheelhouse, but but maybe. Monica, Susanna, would anybody like to? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think I could. Can I? Please do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so the question about uh, the growing diaspora, right? Uh, so, uh, I come from a country that has had very brief uh, moments of independence. So, there have been waves of immigration to Chicago alone from Poland on at least three occasions. And uh, what basically happens is, you know, when things uh, calm down and when the country returns to democracy and there are some, you know, prospects, a lot of people return. Right. So the, the the places with larger diasporas have the ability to, you know, uphold culture, uh, uphold language and actually uh, be very good at facilitating fundraising. So so I wouldn't see necessarily, uh, an, you know, I wouldn't call it an exodus. It could be also like an investment in actually, you know, being able to create the talents uh, elsewhere where, where it is feasible. So uh, and especially when it comes to, you know, the, looking at destinations of refugees, right? So there are certain places like the US where you know once you move here, it's much harder to return. But I think that refugees settling in, in uh, Central Europe or Western Europe are very much in a position to return once, you know, to, to be frank, the, 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 the greatest military danger subsides. 
Uh, and in the meantime, you know, they're investing in human capital, investing in themselves and investing in the future of Ukraine. So I guess the concern is, you know, if the kids have been in Polish schools for four years, then, you know, it's much, much concern, more uh, similar to Ukrainian than people think. Maya, I think my nine year old, it took her a full 15 minutes to realize that she's watching Ukrainian cartoons and not Polish uh, cartoons. You're showing Ukrainian cartoons. That's great. OK, good. Um, I guess I can just get us started on the question about China. It's a big question. I think it's going to be very uh, decisive. Uh, and I haven't heard that particular bit of information about China um, uh, selling uh, weapons to Russia. But I think the bigger question is uh, technology, right? 21st century economies are very, very reliant on a very large range of sophisticated technologies that can often only be supplied by particular companies located in particular places of this world, right? So Russia, obviously, with the sanctions, um, had a lot of Western and European companies uh, pulling out, right? So that has created a lot of problems for the Russian economy. But one, one uh, thing to remember is that Russia has actually been uh, trying to sort of wean itself from dependence on Western technology since 2014, right? So Russia has actually pivoted to China uh, for a long time, right? Uh, but, but so the question is sort of, you know, very critical weapons technologies, where will they come from, right? And I think China is under pressure from the US um, and, and sort of right now there, there's sort of a little public knowledge where, where this is going, but I think it's basically a, a very important question down the road, not, not just for the military industrial complex, but for a number of sectors of the Russian economy. Thank you. There was a question about institution building during war and anti-corruption. We've covered some of that territory already. Is there anything more that, that you would like to say? say yeah, to the of course, I can always say more. Yeah. So I would address it. Uh, yeah. um, the framework is there from uh, National Anti-Corruption Bureau to Special Anti-Corruption Prosecutors to the Anti-Corruption Court. All the pieces are in. Uh, they start to work, uh, um, interestingly, uh, during the war perhaps because uh, there's a lot of attention and much less, but we'll, we'll see how it's going to work out. But I think overall there is understanding uh, that the, the corruption is going to be addressed. The real challenge is this political financing. You, know? you have to offer a legal mechanism to finance politicians. Otherwise, you will be, it will be a little bit of a self-defeating story. Right. Let's take a few more questions. Let's answer all of them. I also want to ask questions. I was, that's what I'm waiting for. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I
be important uh, even after the war is over. Okay, let's take one more question over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is about Russia and primarily, and thank you for primarily about, I've been very bothered by the fact that um, people who were leaving Russia because of the refusal to be drafted or because of refusal to agree with um, the, uh, um, with the regime of the war um, have had a hard time uh, being accepted in um, a lot of places, partly because of a general wave of, of rejection in Russia. Um, so I'm wondering, speaking of collective action and speaking of the fact that the world would be in a better place if Russians can actually counter um, the action of the regime, what can be done? What do you think can be done? Okay. The last question is about what could be done by Russians or Russians or Russians by Russians who object. or Russians who object to the war and and in particular among those who uh, who are not in Russia. Yeah. I could answer. I could answer, could answer, could answer, could answer that. that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I'm kind of optimistic on this because it's true that there were reports that some Russians uh, face some hostility. But hundreds of thousands of Russians became refugees, and basically most of them, despite traumatic experience of being political or whatever refugees, this experience is much better than experience of those Russians who left Russia back 30 years ago. So now, basically, the diaspora offers a huge safety net. Everybody who comes, there is all the information, all kind of support. So countries that uh, there were reported episodes of hostility from Georgia or Kazakhstan, but these countries accepted in a short time each 100,000 refugees, and these are relatively small countries. So people actually found, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people found new temporary homes there. So I'm kind of, this, of course, Russian uh, refugees, they're a concern, but they're relatively relatively well so they are relatively well received and they face relatively good prospects. Constantine the premise of the question as I understand it is that some of the hostility to the extent that it existed was a consequence of the perception that Russians outside of Russia were not doing enough to fight what Russia was doing and so what can Russians outside of Russia do? Oh, I think that they're just refugees. They're basically running from Putin. They're running from prospects to being uh, drafted into war. Of course, they're not, um, I mean, they're not heroes, but uh, I, I, I think they're sort of least guilty and least responsible. A, a lot of people, actually, a lot of people like my peers, my colleagues, a lot of people left Russia despite not being threatened in any way. And uh, my peers are too old to be uh, drafted, but they do not want to be any kind of a part of this. They do not want to work for institutions that support uh, support the war. I, I think it's uh, given what's going on in Ukraine, that's absolutely understandable that there is a hostile attitude towards Russian. I mean, there is still some remaining hostile attitudes towards Germans after 50 or 60 years after the World War II. So I think this will happen, this will be happening for decades to come. But I think still they're sort of relatively um, relatively okay. You've been critical of those who did not leave Russia, the woman who, I was, a, woman who was a friend of ours who who stayed on the job. Uh, in, in this is about basically a cabinet member. So yes, I was unhappy with some of our former friends who are basically very high in the government and who could have been um, more vocal or at least resigned their government job rather than to participate as high government officials in the prosecution of the war. But I never blamed any kind of, I mean, even a deputy minister. So that's just yeah. about yeah. 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 So This discussion for me is a bizarre discussion, really, because um, focuses on Russians who are fleeing, you know, from Ukraine and war. I mean, 
like why is for me it's just like especially in DC, it's strong. It's always like I remember this discussion in 2014 uh, between some advisors to the government. 2014, and I was part of this. And there were a lot of uh, people talking about Russia and Ukraine. And the argument was, listen, you know, this is what the U.S. can do, but the people of the U.S. This is what the the uh, um, the the Russian government can do, but Putin wouldn't be able to to. To sell it to his people, and then we just need to a Poroshenko to tell him to do this. You know, there's like just ig ignorance of the fact. We were so used to thinking about Russians as if other, you know, Russians also is not a homogeneous group, by the way, and they have been oppressing their own ethnic groups and uh, russifying them as they have been doing uh with the ukrainians and sending them to die as the first responders or something so i think the conversation is much richer what do we do about those cultures like uh, my wife's mom originally from russia from certain region russia has taken away their culture by now and everyone talks about them as being, you know, protecting Russia. But you're like, what about their culture? They have been robbed of their culture by Russia. So the, the issue is much more complex. The second one is, you know, there's a little church of forgiveness. You want to be accepted in the West, donate to the Ukrainian defense effort. One dollar. You're not willing to do that? Sorry. You're not honest about you running from bad Putin, you are still on that side. You just like try to live a better life, right? So it's very simple. In my world, which is black and white sometimes, and you understand why is, if you are donating to Ukraine, you are good. If you are not donating to Ukraine, you're not good. If you're Russian specifically, and that's it. You know, very simple. And that's the kind of discussion. And I will welcome people who donate to Ukraine, and I will have nothing to do with people who, whatever they say, are not providing some real support to Ukraine. Yeah, put your actions where your words are. We have other questions unaddressed. There was a have, question about some of the Sharap's report. There was that. There was also a question about, about the role of Western institutions in ensuring that that money goes where it needs to go. We have three minutes left. So let's do a lightning round. So I would like, like to address it. I, I promised to answer five words in the question, but in five words. Uh, I, uh, let's first step, Monica, would you? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about the question about, you know, addressing addressing corruption. And, you know, one thing that I've learned from studying post-communist regimes is that uh, it's much easier to fight corruption when citizens take ownership in their state. And it's very hard under communism. It was very hard for the satellite uh, states in, in the Soviet bloc to take ownership mm -hmm. of the state. You would always refer to the state as them instead of our state. And states were set up to exploit citizens, not to protect them. So to the extent that uh, the, 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 the war has united Ukrainians and, um, and, and, and given them a sense of ownership in their own country, I think that that alone should make it easier to fight corruption because now you're not stealing from some abstract state that was set up by the Soviet Union, but you're actually uh, stealing from your own country. Okay, so if you last word, I know that you've been involved in discussions about how post-war aid would flow to Ukraine and the role of various oh, Western the, the, institutions. Yeah, yeah, the answer is there is simple too, in my view. Uh, I, I try to operationalize everything. I think, the, um, I think that's the, uh, to me, it's a very effective framework. Actions. So, you know, what I want to see for to determine how the aid flows, if it's sufficient or not, have benchmarks, have professional audit, have reports, transparency. It has to be a technical discussion. This is how much a square meter or square foot costs to rebuild. That's actually a well known number in any market. And if we build according to that, that's fine. If we don't, well, we don't care if it's corruption or legal corruption, that's not appropriate. And you know that we can check the quality of the roads. The now, so all of this, a lot of this is going to be physical infrastructure being rebuilt. That is very verifiable, you know. 
that's very verifiable how much it should cost and uh, so set up audit committees set up benchmarking and then agree ex ante on prioritization you know what goes first what goes second and then mm -hmm. it will be so turn it into technical there was this rant report about uh pushing uh ukraine to come let's push russia to compromise can we at least start writing reports about how we put russia to compromise mm -hmm. instead of keep writing reports about uh, how we should Ukraine the, the, to compromise. The same author a year ago wrote a report named uh, "Transferring Western Weapons Would Not Help Ukraine." Oh, it's Samuel Sharab mm -hmm. again. <laughs> oh my God, I have the displeasure of having to author the piece with him at some point. No, I'm not. I, I'm just. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so I put a tower note. Yeah. Well, let's. Um, listen, I have to go. There, there, there are a lot of. No, no, no. no we, I'm sorry, we don't. We have a short question. Okay, you have the last question. Okay, okay great. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Good. Almost. So, to my take, um, how Ukrainian people, people in Ukraine, and we as the audience can make sure that you are telling the truth about the corruption situation in Ukraine? Um, me specifically? Right now, you check the facts, you know, uh, Ukraine, I use the specific fact on the Ukrainian military, check it, you know, how Ukrainian military performed in 2022 and 2013. Check the facts. And that's a responsibility I said. Well, what are some good sources for those who would like to, to check the facts? So after the war, we're going to your dacha and check whether you have yeah. gold, gold and gold. <laughs> right? I do. Uh, well, I, I, I am transparent in the sense that they have to report. I'm a public, a politically exposed person, so I report everything, everything which is above 3,000. But uh, um, it's the same as with everything. You, uh, during the war, the only true answer is eyewitness. You have to go and figure out it for yourself or choose who you trust but don't make a mistake okay during the war the truth is eyewitness account nothing else is truth so you want to figure it out come to ukraine and figure it out for yourself and then tell others who trust you okay 